Today I thought I'd do a video and show you how I restore and repair a Commodore 64. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to do a repair on this machine I have right here. And you guys are going to love this thing. So I went and found the nastiest ugh, Commodore 64 I could find. So this will be fun. We'll go through the full process of restoring and repairing this machine. So both repairing any faults it has, plus also restoring it to the best cosmetic condition I can, given its state. So without further ado, enjoy this. Oh, how's this look? Oof. Ugh. This is the nastiest Commodore 64 I have ever seen. And if you're wondering about this stuff, I'm pretty sure it's mold. That it was nasty. This thing is just gross. So when I got the stone collection, this is one of the machines that was underneath the table in the back corner where the leak was. So it was a really, really nasty space. Um, it's kind of interesting right here. It's got a label on it says screen freezes up occasionally or goes blank then comes on again rev b 8 of 91 then under that it says no video and this is a kennedy k through 18 school district machine so kennedy's a middle school here in town uh cm345 school district 4j eugene oregon has a eugene public schools property tag 8400258 and serial number is P0141982. And in typical with American machines, it's just a label stuck here because they're too big to fit in the spot that was molded for them. On the back, I've got a bit of copper foil sticking out of the cartridge port. The RF modulator is not too rusty. Oh, things look nasty inside of here though. Now, one thing that this machine didn't come with, but is very important to talk about real quick here, is power supplies. Basically, it comes to this. There are a lot of options for Commodore 64 power supplies. Like all of these. So, it's very likely that if you've got yourself a Commodore 64 that you can repair, it probably came with a power supply that looks something like this. This is what's commonly known in the Commodore vernacular as a black brick of death. And this one really, really, really lives up to that name. And if I plug this in and check the voltages on here, this power supply puts 12 volts out where it's supposed to be five. If you plug this into a Commodore 64, this is going to kill a lot of chips on your machine. So, you got to be really careful with these. Now, what I recommend you do if you don't have a good aftermarket supply and you don't want to spend the money to buy one is go to Ray Carlson's site. I will link it down below and buy yourself one of these. This is Ray Carlson's Commodore Saver. It simply plugs into a power supply and then plugs into the Commodore 64. And what this will do is if your power supply is putting out too much voltage, this will not let it through. Now, another thing you might get, which is really nice, is you might get something like this. So this is a vintage replacement supply for the Commodore 64. And the nice thing about this one is that it's serviceable. It's nice and light. It's a switching supply. I can pull this apart, replace parts, service it, and check it. You might also get one of these. This is a later supply. They are reputed to be more reliable, but still possibly problematic. And this came with a 64C. So you might see a white one if you got a 64C. And this one reads good. So one other thing I should mention is that there are some tools you're going to need. And there's a lot of tools that are nice to have, but not absolutely necessary. First of all, to clean these machines, it's pretty basic stuff. You'll need some rags. You'll need some Q-tips some brushes. In this case, this is just a detailing brush I use on cases. This is an anti-static brush that can be used on boards. This is a uh, cranial brush. And then for cleaning supplies, you're just going to need like 99% isopropyl alcohol and some Windex, just basic Windex with ammonia works great. Now, other tools that can be nice to have are 
the dead test and diagnostic cartridges. And these, especially the dead test, can be really a time saver and can be had off of eBay really inexpensive. In fact, what you can do is get yourself a combo instead of two cartridges like I have here. They make a combo cartridge with a switch on it. You switch it one way, you got dead test. You switch it the other way, you have the diagnostic or diag cartridge. To go with the diag, you don't need to have a harness, but it can be really nice. I use this harness, which I got from Bill Pelton off of Facebook. Uh, the nice thing about this harness is it doesn't have wires, so it's just really easy to use. Um, without the harness, you're going to get some tests that come back as failed, but if you look it up and know which ones will show as failed, it at least can give you some information with just the cartridge, but a diag is nice later. And I believe you can get a cartridge with the uh, harness for under $50. Another thing that's nice to have is some kind of a flash cartridge. I use the Easy Flash 3. There's a few other options out there. It just makes it really easy to load up stuff. I have a whole bunch of tools on here, diagnostic tools, that I can just plug this into the cartridge port, turn it on, and go. Also, just a regular cartridge. In this case, I have Moon Patrol. Um, Zaxxon is, I think, the uh, standard, but I haven't come across that one yet. But just a cartridge, because sometimes a machine will work with a cartridge when it won't work without. That just has to do with the way the machine is wired. Uh, finally, if you're going to fix these machines, you're going to need to have a few basics. So let me move this out of the way. So you can go with a soldering station like this. If you're going to do a lot of this, I recommend it. If you only plan to do the one machine, just get yourself a basic 15 watt or 20 watt soldering iron. So I like this weller by the way it looks. There are a couple other options out there. I'll link them in the description below. So that's soldering iron. Finally, you will need, at a minimum, a basic electronic meter. This one's a little bit fancier than the one you'll see I started with earlier in this uh, channel's history. Um, the advantage of one like this, which is about $150, is that it's a lot faster. Uh, finally, you're going to need to be able to display your output on a screen. And I recommend a Commodore 1702 monitor if you can find one that's working. If you got to go with an HDMI monitor, which I think is a terrible experience. It brings out all the flaws in these old machines, some of which I don't consider flaws because they were not visible with a real CRT. So you can use something like this. This is the cable I made in an earlier video, and this is a RetroTINK 2X Pro. So with a special homemade cable that goes from the Commodore video out to S-Video, a RetroTINK 2X Pro for, I think they're around 150 bucks these days. This will connect to the HDMI. I can run it straight into my monitor and bada bing, bada boom, I can see if it's working. And this just powers off a of USB. This is by no means a comprehensive examination of the tools you need. I'll do a video in the future where I kind of go over all the tools I use and the ones I consider absolutely necessary, ones that are nice to have, and ones that are convenient, but you know, you can do without. Now we'll take a look at inside. So, this is probably a sign of things to come, but these screws are all quite rusty. Let's see what we will see. Yo, you guys get to see it before I do. What do you think? Am I gonna like poop bricks? Oh, I expected worse than that, although I do see a lot of grime and rust, especially right there. All kinds of white, crusty buildup on the power. It's like a couple of the RAM chips have been replaced in the past. The processor, the SID chip, and one of the CIAs are socketed. The rest are not and then let's go ahead and get this out of here so I can see what I'm doing. Now the internal screws are not rusty, although one of them's missing. The fact that it said chips on the side kind of makes me a little nervous. Hopefully that doesn't mean this thing's been scavenged 
for parts. And I think maybe that was just its future, but it got shoved down under that table and hopefully never fulfilled that future. And I'm going to show you another machine in a little bit that I worked on that had so many bad chips that it's going to be very difficult, if not impossible, to repair it for a, for a reasonable price. Wow, this thing is like glued down in here. Wow. No, there's still a screw in it. Hey, idiot. <laughs> One more. Yeah. <clears throat> Got something in my mouth. Gross. So this looks like what I was seeing from ants. Like you may have seen that Amiga 1000 with the ants. So this is going straight in the trash. Uh, hey, look. It's rusty. Surprise, surprise. Okay. So lots and lots of nasty debris in the bottom of the case. As you can see. So this is going straight in the ultrasonic cleaner. What I do is I take the cover, just knock off the very nastiest stuff. Now there is nothing that says you can't just clean the cover right here in the sink. I usually start with Dawn and then after I use the Dawn I move on to use uh, Simple Green or just Windex. But a tool that's nice to have but far from necessary is ultrasonic cleaner. You don't need to have an ultrasonic cleaner but I knew I had a lot of machines like this although this is the worst one I could find and they're gross and on top of that with my business I had a five gallon $1,300 ultrasonic cleaner for like 25 years and it's just hard to go back once you have that convenience. This is an inexpensive, about $350 unit, I think. It holds about two gallons. It's just big enough to run a Commodore 64 board or cover in it in two passes, so it has to lean out. And when we start it, it'll run for six minutes. Then I'll flip it around, run it for six minutes more, and then I'll rinse it off and clean it from there. What a lovely noise. Also want to get the keyboard off of here and get the top case cleaned. Basically, I want to get both cases cleaned because it's nice and sunny out. And while I'm repairing the machine, these two case halves can enjoy a nice sun bath while they generally untan. So they'll uh, get rid of some of the yellowing. I'm not going to retro bright them, probably. Um, I generally don't retro bright things unless they are just beyond saving. Um, in this case, I want to keep this machine's history. I want to keep its school district affiliation intact. So they're just going to get cleaned and then uh, sun brighted. Now the, uh, the Kennedy's written in Sharpie and that's unavoidably going to fade a little bit, but I want to clean it. It's just too gross to leave it that way. The label here does have to come off and it's probably going to be like crusted on there permanently. Eh, looks like it's going to come off okay. It's still a little bit tacky. It's not totally crusty and dry, which is unusual. So that needs to come off. And that went on after this machine was yellowed or the machine has yellowed regardless of it. And then this no video, that's going to have to come off as well. This is an interesting label, so I will save it and maybe we can stick it inside later. So just like the bottom half, which has already been through the ultrasonic cleaner, this will now go and get rinsed off and go in the cleaner. And I'll do that in a minute. In the meantime, I want to show you then, once the parts are cleaned, they're not quite ready for sun brighting. We still need to get anything that, be it oils or any other crusty bits that'll block the UV from the sun. That is going to leave some discolored areas or some modeling that is probably unavoidable in this machine's condition, but I want to get as much as I can off. So start out with, just hit it with Windex, and then a magic eraser, not too heavily, but we'll just kind of 
get all the crud out of the pores. And the ultrasonic cleaner does a pretty good job, but I don't like running these in the cleaner for too long. So these have only been through six minutes on each half. And of course I'm avoiding that because I don't want to remove it. These are going out because it's a nice sunny day and they'll spend the rest of today and it's, it's about two o'clock and all day tomorrow out in the sun. All right, so it's time for the first bit of soldering for this project. And I just need to take the shield off the board. I've got my soldering iron set for 400 degrees Celsius, which is 50 degrees hotter than I normally use. And I also have a heavier soldering tip on it. Something like this, this is much, much heavier than the fine tip I usually use for soldering chips. But we've got really, really heavy ground planes that these tabs are soldered to. So you just need the thermal mass to get it loose. So these take a fair amount of heat to release. And I like to add a little bit of solder to it. Um, when I add this extra solder, it really makes it flow better. So then first I just see if I can pop these loose with just the screwdriver. Usually you can. And there's really no need, I don't think, to remove the existing solder. And this is coming off really easily, but usually that's because it's been removed before. Finally, there is often one right here, not always, but often that one is actually not attached. Okay. <laughs> I don't know if you can see all the crud that just came out from under here. This is a paper insulator that's there to keep the chips from shorting out on the metal shield. And then here's the metal shield. It's quite rusty. Hopefully I can save it. If not, I should have a couple kicking around. I don't usually return the top shield to a board unless it's the all metal kind, but I usually do put a shield on the bottom just because it makes it fit the case better. And looking at the bottom, I can see Lots of signs of this, that, and the other thing. Oh, this is nasty. See here how much grime again on these chips in the center. So the next thing I like to do is remove that since we're not going to need it and then remove these covers. So just a little leverage off of there. And we can see we have a ceramic VIC-2. And then we have RF modulator. Normally, when I'm working on a machine like this, I test it first, but this one was so nasty. So now I'm going to go ahead and test this. However, my puppers here says, no, no, no. You need to stop the cameras and give me attention. She's hurt her foot. She has a sprained or broken toe, according to the vet. Poor Luna. Or, I mean, poor Agnes. All right, so making sure none of these caps are shortened out. They all look okay. Almost always bent down like that, so don't sweat it. And so next, what I'm going to do is I'm going to go ahead and remove the SID chip. And the reason is, is until I know this board is working happily, I only thing I lose by removing the SID chip is I lose sound and I lose paddles. I don't care about either. I do care if that SID's good about frying it. Other than that, we look okay. So I'll be back in a second and we'll hook it up and run a test and see what happens. Okay, so now for the moment of truth. I've got it all hooked up. I'm running through the 1702 monitor. Um, when I capture, I'll do that later, but for the first test, I like to just use a real monitor. The whole capture thing has issues, so I like to know that if I'm getting a black screen, I'm really getting a black screen. So, here we go. In three, two, one. Oh, that is a screen I have never seen before. That is interesting to say the least. Wow. Strobing, this whole thing is flickering and moving, but the whole rolling thing is being caused by the phone not sinking.
All right, so I'm going to try one more thing, and that is a dead test cartridge. No harness or anything. I just want to see if we get anything. So dead test plugs in here. That does. Exact same thing. So other thing I can do is I can remove this CIA, which I think has like pretty much a 0% chance, but it's socketed, so we'll pull it anyway. CIA has a bent pin that looks like was not very well in its socket. Yep, same thing. After a six minute trip through the ultrasonic cleaner, top side of the board looks much better, but bottom side still just has this nasty waxy film on it. And I'm thinking that this is just from moisture. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to use an anti-static brush, wet in an area with alcohol, and just see what happens. Okay, so that cleaned up pretty well. I'm, uh, I'm fairly happy with it. There are a few things on it that I don't care for. So this socket that somebody put on is a double wipe. The crusty's cleaned up pretty good, but you can see there's some pretty ugly spots, like right there. There are some not so great solder joints there. So, gonna clean those up. I don't think they need to be replaced. We'll find out later, but uh, just so you know, I've already hooked it back up and tested it. It's still doing the exact same thing, and that's just to check to make sure I didn't introduce new problems. Okay, so next thing we can do is check some voltages. First, we'll check the 12 volts and the 5 volts off of the voltage regulators. 11.93 looks great. And on the 5 volts, we got 5.025. Now, those two voltages are coming off of the AC 9 volts coming from the power supply. They are not the 5 volts from the power supply. And that also tells me that the fuse is good. There's no need to check the fuse. If the fuse was bad, these wouldn't have voltages at all. And then the next thing we want to do is we'll check the 5 volts from the power supply. This right here is on the cassette port, 4.29 volts. Sorry, 4.927 volts. And just going to check a few ICs. Going to need my auxiliary eyeballs for that. The ROMs get power there, 4.9 volts. So those are getting voltage. Typically this last pin on... A lot of stuff is the 5 volt supply now I think on this RAM it's not alright so we've got good voltages the next thing I want to check is that we have a good uh, clock so go ahead and check the clock that's pin 1 got a nice clock pin 39 so there's a phase clock and then we have the reset all right, so the first thing I want to do is I want to check the CPU and make sure that that's working. And I want to test these two RAM chips that have been uh, socketed, so somebody's messed with them before. And while I'm at it, I'll test the VIC chip too. So make sure this is off. I'm just going to unplug it. And we'll remove said chips. So starting with the hard to get to VIC. Pull that out. Well, the CPU and the RAM chips. Okay, set that aside. And I'm going to start with the RAM chips because, hey, they're the easiest, right? And test failed. Expected a zero, got a one. This one's testing much better. Oh. But it still failed just much later in the test. So it appears that both of these RAM chips are defective. Yay! Boo! Alright, got the ZIF 64. Hey, we got a working Commodore 64. Look at that. No surprise. So first thing I want to try is let's just see if our problem is caused by that VIC chip. 
does not appear to be. We got a good looking screen and we got a cursor. So good. That looks all right. The other thing I want to test just real quick is the CPU. So, <laughs> okay. Perfect. Got a good looking C64. So we've got a, it looks like a good CPU and a good VIC. So in most cases when I'm repairing machines, I want to work quickly because I got a lot of machines to repair. So these are just quick tests I can do to see if they're bad and move on. Clearly I have a couple bad RAM chips. So the next step is to pull this off and try this other machine again with new RAM. Maybe that's all we've got wrong, which would be sweet. So the other thing I'm looking at here that I don't like is that's a single wipe socket. These are single wipe sockets and this one's soldered in pretty badly. Um, so it takes a long time to replace them, but I may find that's necessary whether I want to or not. So, and then the two new RAM chips. Because these chips are new, the uh, legs are splayed out a little bit, so. I get one set into their slots and then bend the chip down a little bit, slide the others in, and there you go. Boy, that went in way too easy. That, that is a junk socket. And obviously when we're repairing these machines, there's plenty and plenty of electrical things to fix, but a lot of times the issues are mechanical. And by mechanical, I mean things like bad connections where you just physically don't have the electrons able to get through. Exact same thing. So even though we've got two new RAM chips, no improvement. And pressing on this VIC is not doing a thing. Okay, well, now we got through some of the basic checks. So the next thing I wanna do is go ahead and check the video signals. That is something I haven't had to mess with too much, so it should be fascinating to work with. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go to the schematic. I'm going to take a look, see what I should have on the various outputs of the VIC and the support chips and what's going to the RF modulator. Um, so everything coming into the RF modulator, I believe, is just coming in on these two headers. So I can check those to see what I've got and try to backtrack from there and see where I run into trouble. Okay, so this video is getting really long and I actually have to order a part. So I'm gonna wrap this up for today here and I will have part two out shortly. Also, I'm gonna split the keyboard part off to its whole separate video and I'm gonna use that as a detailed how you restore a keyboard and then refer to that in all future videos or most future videos rather than showing keyboard restoration again and again and again and again and again and again and again. 80s reference, you name it. So as soon as it's ready, part two will be right here and the keyboard video will be in the description below. And thanks for coming.